Okay, so we've got our 10 seconds here and she'll give me the live heads up. Very good. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Facebook Live episode of our Franklin Outside series. If you're just joining us today, we've been covering everything from trees to bees, the life sciences, the natural sciences, and the environmental sciences. Today, we have a very special guest. We're honored to welcome Dr. Michael Sparla from the Pennsylvania State University. He's a research professor of arthropod identification there, and he's joining us today to talk about the murder hornet. If you haven't heard about the murder hornet just yet, you are in uh, for kind of a kind of a treat, kind of a, a scary update here. We've been hearing about sightings of this very, very nasty pest in the Northwest United States. And we've been wondering at TFI if we are in for um, some negative impacts here on the East Coast and in Philadelphia. So Dr. Scarlo, welcome and thank you for joining us. Why the heck are we talking about the murder hornet today? Well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody that is uh, listening in today. Um, so we're talking about murder hornets because uh, they're, uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm going to be calling them Asian giant hornets because that is probably a better common name. And we can talk about common names later. Um, but a lot of people do know them as murder hornets because of a New York Times article that was published earlier in the month. Uh, and got a lot of people worried about it. Um, and there is there is some truth to what was in the article. The Asian giant hornets were discovered last year in the Pacific Northwest, uh, specifically in a small area of Washington State and adjacent Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Uh, there was one nest that was eradicated at that time uh, and a couple workers that were found. Uh, it's the first time that this species has been found in North America. Um, and that's uh, where we're at with it. It's not been found in the Eastern United States yet, um, but because this news article went out, uh, a lot of other news agencies picked it up and the word got around and people got really worried that uh, it was in the Eastern United States or uh, that it was a threat. Sure, and, and certainly with that name, I mean the term murder hornet, we were talking about it before, before we started our live stream here today. Of course, there's there's a lot of heightened emotion these days, right? And perhaps the term murder hornet caught on um, because we're already feeling kind of stretched it th thin, kind of stressed out. Um, and that's not typically the way, of course, that pests like this are named. So you mentioned that we do want to call them giant hornets. Um, what, you know, what, how do, how do we actually land on common names like that um, when we're naming insects? Sure. So murder hornet is certainly very evocative. Reminds me of something like killer bee. Sure. Um, and, you know, just the name makes it sound like it's coming to get you. Um, and from what I can tell, no entomologist in North America has ever heard that name in English. Uh, in the scientific literature, they're either called giant hornets or Asian giant hornets. Uh, the Entomological Society of America, which is the group of entomolo professional entomologists and, and non-professional entomologists, if you're interested, um, does uh, kind of regulate the common name usage of common names in English in North America. Uh, this species doesn't have an official common name. Uh, so I've been using Asian giant hornet since that's what's most commonly used in the literature. Uh, as far as we can tell, murder hornet, um, was used first in about 2008 on some Japanese uh, language programming. Um, and it's been used off and on in news programs in Japan since then. Uh, they've got other more prevalent common names even in Japanese than murder hornet. Um, my favorite one uh, translates to giant sparrow wasp. Ah, um, sparrow so, wasp. Yeah, and so I wrote a fact sheet about uh, the Asian giant hornets um, I use Asian giant hornet throughout because, again, that's what's most commonly used in the, in the literature, but uh, I suggest we move to sparrow wasp because, one, it evokes that common name in, Jap in Japanese where it's from. Uh, it also, um, there have been issues with geographic place names uh, and use in names like trying to call COVID the Asia virus or the China virus in reactions against people from those countries. Uh, so we're trying to move away from using geographic place names in uh, naming things. We don't want people to get angry at 
Japanese people because we call it the Asian giant hornet. Sure, um, sure. So much power, of course, coded power in, in language like that. Sure. So thank you for bringing that up. So let's refer to it then as, as the giant hornet, henceforth. Um, Wait, do that. <laughs> let's go for it. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know if we wanted to tag that one again. Um, but, but it was named the murder hornet for, for a very specific reason, right? It does have sort of a, an aggressive uh, behavior, particularly when it comes to honeybees. And so one of the very first questions that's been asked here is how did it get to the States and why is it called the murder hornet in the first place? Okay, so we don't know how it got to the North America. Um, I suspect in, in most entomology suspects it was in cargo. So uh, giant hornets are uh, social wasps. So they make an annual nest, the, a fertilized queen over winters. Uh, she goes out in the spring and makes a new nest, raises her own workers. That nest grows through the summer. They make more reproductive, so males and new queens in the fall. Mm -hmm. Those queens mate in over winter, and then the rest of the nest, that original queen and all the workers die out. So the only individual that, that survives the winter are those fertilized queens that then make new nests. So what we suspect happened was a fertilized queen who was overwintering was shipped over in some kind of trade material. Um, there is a, another related species of wasp that is invasive in Europe right now, which is also called the giant hornet. Uh, so again, not great common names because they share it. Um, and it was thought that that was introduced into Europe via uh, bonsai pots that were imported from Japan. So the fact that it was found in, the, in uh, the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of trade that comes from Asia into that area, probably came in trade. Um, there is, in Japan, uh, some people will hunt down the nests and pull the larvae and some of the adults out. They're a delicacy. Uh, they're eaten there. Mm. So there is a very, 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 very tiny chance that somebody introduced it on purpose to start that kind of business here. Sure. I do not think that that's what happened, but I mean, we've seen that before with things like um, snakehead fish in the Eastern United States. Mm -hmm. So I hesitate to say that it, it's probably not how it happened. It was probably via trade, but we so don't I, know. I also heard one, um, one out there theory, perhaps, that uh, its larvae are used as a per, an athletic performance uh, enhancer. Is there any truth to that? I have not heard that. Um, but yeah, sure. Again, that's similar to, to eating it as a delicacy. Sure. Somebody may have introduced it on purpose, but I, I don't think that's probably what happened. Okay. So potentially brought here on purpose folks, um, but probably, uh, probably not probably hitched a ride. It sounds. And then the other part of that question was why we call them the murder hornets in the first place. And of course that has to do a little bit with the honeybees that we already mentioned. Yeah. So, it, uh, giant hornets have, it's, a really neat behavior, I think, um, where they mass attack honeybee hives. If you think about what a honeybee colony is, um, it is a great source if you're a predator for protein. Uh, you think about bears ripping into a, a honeybee hive to eat the larvae and the pupae, uh, they're doing it for the protein and the honey. Um, and Asian giant hornets or giant hornets are doing it for the same reason. Um, they, in the fall, need lots of protein to support the production of new queens and males. And to support that pr um, production of reproductive, the reproductive cast, uh, they scout for protein. And one way that they do that is to attack honeybees. They're much bigger than honeybees. And so uh, attacks on honeybee colonies have this um, kind of sequence of events where individual Hornets will go and find a honeybee colony and they'll kill individual bees and uh, masticate or chew those bees up and take them back to the hive one by one by one. And a single hornet can kill, you know, a few dozen bees in a day. Uh, but when you get multiple hornets from the same hive that start attacking a honeybee colony, they move into, uh, and I actually really love this, uh, the slaughter phase of the attack. It is called that in the, in the academic literature. Um, the slaughter phase. The slaughter phase, okay. where they recruit more workers up to, uh, you know, up to 20 or 30 individual hornets to the same honeybee colony. And instead of killing individual bees and taking them back to the nest, 
they will just sit and kill bees and kill bees and kill bees and can kill up to 14 bees a minute. So nice. with just a few dozen wasps, they can kill up to 25,000 bees in a day or two. Uh, once all of the adult bees are dead, the hornets will then guard that hive and pull out all of the larvae and pupae, which are packed with protein, and use that as a protein source to feed their own colony. So they're, they're killing the honeybees because they want the, the larval bees, the immature bees. Okay. Um, and yeah, once they kill all the, the adults, all the worker bees, um, they get very defensive and will guard that because it's a food resource for them. Uh, we don't like it because they attack um, honeybee colonies that we have, uh, that we try to get honey from, but they just see it as a food source. Sure. Okay, so aptly named, perhaps, <laughs> then with the, with the murder hornet, a pretty gnarly um, approach there. And they're there not after the honey, they're there actually trying to uh, decapitate yeah, in many cases. Is that, is that right? They decapitate yeah. the, the target bees and then they take their thorax. Yes, yeah, so they kill the bees. Um, so initially, when they're just attacking individual bees, they just take the thorax back because again, they're after protein and that's where all the musculature for the wings and the legs are. So it's packed with muscle tissue, which mm -hmm. is protein. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they go into that slaughter phase, they target, they just kill bees. They, they leave all the dead bodies there. They don't go after the thorax anymore uh, and just kill all the bees until there's no defense left. And then they raid the nest. So we do know, while these uh, bees can be problematic in parts of Japan, parts of Asia, um, we also know that honeybees in these areas of the world haven't been completely killed off. So do honeybees have some sort of defense against, against the giant hornet? Yeah, so Japanese honeybees in particular, um, the subspecies of honeybee that is in Japan, uh, have this balling behavior where um, when a hornet comes into the nest, uh, the bees, I guess, form a ball or dog pile on top of it, and they start to beat their wings and release CO2, and that raises the levels of CO2 and the temperature inside that ball. And Asian giant hornets die at about 116 degrees Fahrenheit, while the honeybees die at about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So the bees ride this really fine line where they heat the ball up, and kill the hornet, and they do lose a couple bees on the way uh, because some of them in the middle just can't survive. Mm -hmm. uh, but a sacrificing a handful of workers to save the entire colony by killing that scout hornet uh, often is successful. Um, and it's so successful that uh, they also have a behavior where, uh, in the literature, it's, it's termed like, I see you, where they start making noise when they see a hornet scout. And the Hornet Scout knows like I've been spotted, like they're gonna kill me if I try to get in. So they don't even necessarily have to kill that Scout Hornet. They can warn them like, I see you. And if you come over here, we're gonna kill you. That's um, extraordinary. So that's with Japanese honeybees that have co-evolved with Asian giant hornets. Uh, European honeybees or Western honeybees, which is the species that we use in apiculture for honey, uh, because they haven't co-evolved with the Asian giant hornets, they don't have that behavior. So the giant hornets come over and absolutely massacre the honeybees. And instead of bawling on the, the hornet, they retreat into the hive, which doesn't really do anything. It doesn't save them. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have a couple questions relating to natural predators. Um, so it sounds like perhaps in Japan, the, the Japanese honeybee can can help kill off the, the giant hornet, but now um, perhaps not here in the U.S. So are there other natural predators um, that the giant hornet may have, whether it's here in the U.S. or, or elsewhere? Um, that is a great question, and I am not sure. I'm sure there are some birds out there, especially in their native range, that feed on them. Um, we, and maybe this is skipping ahead a little bit, uh, European hornets have been introduced to North America, especially in the east. Uh, the workers are about the same size as Asian giant hornets, and there are other insects and birds and things that predate them here. So presumably, if Asian giant hornets got here, you know, similar things would predate them as well. Mm -hmm. And what methods are, are we using, are humans using, uh, to hunt down and kill 
um, these giant hornets. You mentioned that those uh, nests that were found, or those individuals rather, that were found in the Northwest US uh, were killed off, they were eradicated fully. So uh, what's the best way for, for humans to go about uh, killing the giant hornet? Okay, so uh, there's a couple things that we can do. If you're a beekeeper, um, beekeepers in Asia have developed a number of methods to keep their hives safe, um, including using what are called robber screens. So the, the, the screens that limit access into the, the hive, uh, and that can often keep the hornets out because they just can't find their way in. So you lose workers that fly out, but eventually they give up on the attack because they can't find their way into the hive. Um, they also, when the hornets are scouting the hives, they're not aggressive at all. So Asian beekeepers, if you've got a small enough operation, just go out with wooden sticks and hit them out of the air and step on them uh, because they're, they're very large hornets and you can just hit them with a stick. Um, as far as finding individual colonies goes, um, I'm not exactly sure how they found the one in the Northwest. I think they found a bunch of workers and then triangulated, you know, it's in this forest somewhere, let's go look. And they were walking along and somebody got stung. Uh, and then they found like, oh, it's within 15 feet of where we're at right now. Um, the problem with finding the nests in particular and why it's so difficult is they make underground nests. So they don't make a big paper nest in a tree like bald-faced hornets or even a semi-exposed aerial nest in like a tree hollow the way European hornets do. They excavate underground nests, uh, typically around pine roots or in pine forests, uh, but also in other places as well, uh, in abandoned rodent burrows. They find like an old chipmunk hole and expand that to build their nest. So because they're building these underground nests, it's much more difficult to find, find them. Is that a fairly common adaptation for flying insects to burrow underground? Certainly sounds like it helps uh, them hide from humans. Sure, it depends on the group. Um, yellow jackets uh, that many people are familiar with do a similar thing here. There are a number of species that typically nest in the ground, uh, maybe nest a couple feet above the ground in some kind of protected space like the wall void of a house or inside a, a hay bale or something. Uh, but we, haven't, we have even native species that do that here. Uh, bumblebees are another great example. Sure, sure. Um, so we have another question from Matt, he's nine years old, and Matt asks how we can protect honeybees from them. And I'm going to add to that, how can we um, protect pollinators in general? Because we know that it sounds like the giant hornet can be a threat, um, although perhaps it's not the greatest threat to honeybees or, or to pollinators writ large. Sure. So assuming that Asian giant hornets become established. We can't eradicate them and they spread throughout the West, West Coast. <clears throat> um, we have a couple of things going for us. So the Asian giant hornets only target honeybee colonies in the fall, starting in about August, really in September and October. And the biggest reason we ship honeybees to, especially California, is the almond harvest. Uh, for almond pollination, and that happens in the spring. So uh, it's likely that the biggest reason we take honeybees out to the West Coast, the almonds, isn't like that's not going to be threatened by the Asian giant hornets. They just they don't attack bees that time of year. Um, individual beekeepers can do things like use rubber screens, um, kill individual hornets when they see them. If if you see uh, Asian giant hornets, typically only mass attack honeybee colonies that are within about half a kilometer of their nest. Uh, they will attack colonies individually further from that up to about three kilometers or what, about five miles, um, but they won't mass attack. It'll just be one hornet killing bees and taking them back. Uh, so if you start to see a mass attack, you know that there has to be a colony somewhere close by and you can probably find it and eradicate it. Um, as far as, so, I say all of this about honeybees with the caveat that um, honeybees are a domestic agricultural species. Uh, people hear pollinators and they automatically think honeybees. Honeybees aren't the most important pollinators out there, uh, even for crops. We as humans use them because they are convenient. Uh, honeybees are relatively docile. You can smoke them and you don't get stung. 
Uh, the hives are easy to move. You can put them on a flatbed trailer and ship them across the country, save for the almond harvest in California. Uh, and they're domesticated uh, and we like honey. But they're not the best pollinators. Uh, we use them because they're convenient. Um, they're native pollinators. So other species of bees are better pollinators of native crops, things like squashes and tomatoes um, and various tree fruits. Uh, and we don't think that Asian giant hornets will likely have a large impact on native pollinators because uh, most native pollinators are solitary nesters. They, it's just a single female that is laying her eggs in a nest either in the ground or in some kind of hollow stem. Uh, you think about the bee hotels that you put up with hollow stems and, and holes in wood and stuff. Uh, and those, a lot of those are native pollinators. Um, and we don't think that Asian honey, that Asian giant hornets will go after them because they're not making these large nests that are packed with larvae that represent a protein source uh, for the, the hornets. Um, okay, that, that relates to an, another question that we had, and I think it actually answers it. The question was, do murder hornets kill every type of bee? It sounds like they, they might find them to be a delicacy, but uh, perhaps they won't wipe out an entire grouping of them and it all has to do with nesting uh, mm -hmm. patterns. Is that a fair assum assumption there? Yeah, and I'm not even sure that they'll go after other social bees. Like I don't, so there are bumblebee species present in Japan, and I don't think there are records of Asian giant hornets attacking bumblebees because they nest in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't even think that they'll attack all native social bees. Uh, it's mostly just honeybees. They will attack other um, social wasps, so they'll, they'll attack other hornets, um, yellow jackets. Uh, the the social stinging insects that have these large aerial nests uh, so there may be there might be an impact on yellow jackets uh but you know not not native bees probably okay good to note good to note um i do want to draw uh one word that you that you use there i just want to clarify for our audience you use the social um, mm -hmm. bees um i take it that that means of course those that nest in grouping yeah so that's insect or the bees and wasps that have a queen. She is the only uh, reproducing member of the colony and the workers are sterile and build the nests. So um, things that people will be familiar with are honeybees, of course, bumblebees, uh, yellow jackets and paper wasps, uh, bald-faced hornets and other hornets. Um, there are some other native bees that can be social. So various sweat bees can be social or not, even within the same species. Um, most people probably aren't going to be as familiar with those. And then most of the other species are solitary. So uh, every individual female is reproductive and making their own nest. They may nest in groups. So there's various degrees of subsociality where they may think things like cicada killers, which is a wasp, um, you know, one or to maybe a few hundred individuals might nest in the same area because it's the kind of soil substrate they like and they tolerate each other in the same environment because their nests don't overlap, but they're not nesting together. They're not sharing a nest. Okay, good clarification there, certainly. And you mentioned the Eastern cicada killer. Mm -hmm. In some pieces that you've written on the um, Asian giant hornet, you've mentioned uh, that they have sort of a, a similar look to the Eastern cicada killer. Um, but we also don't think that we're expecting to spot these here on the East Coast. So what are some of the major distinctions then between the cicada killer? And then I'd like to pivot a little bit uh, to address why we don't think we'll expect to see them here on the East Coast, certainly anytime soon. Okay, so I've, there are actually a number of wasp species that people have been mistaking for Asian giant hornets. Um, I haven't gotten any cicada killers yet because they're not active. They come out later in the season. Uh, we think people might mistake them for Asian giant hornets because they are big wasps that are brightly colored. Um, they're about, they're actually a little bit bigger than Asian giant hornet workers. Um, you know, an inch and a half long. They're big wasps. Um, so we think just based on that, that people might mistake them for that. Uh, what I've been seeing mostly are European hornets and southern yellow jackets. And um, it's difficult to describe how you distinguish them without having photos. Uh, but 
Um, we did put a fact sheet out about them. If you compare the photos side by side, the differences are pretty obvious. It comes down to differences in coloration of the abdomen um, in the head. Uh, and side by side, it's, it's obvious, but again, it's difficult to describe maybe. Um, Asian giant hornets are more banded. Uh, they're yellow and black banded on the abdomen where the European hornets have some red in there and they have these spots that kind of descend from the band. So it looks like a weird B maybe instead of a, a, a straight band. Sure. So we can drop the link uh, to that fact sheet that you mentioned oh, um, in the chat here. I know it's tough without uh, the photos. So the second part of that, that previous question then had to do with why we don't expect uh, to see the hornet. There's been, you know, the news media um, coverage on this, I think, came up quite quickly and went away just as quickly. I wouldn't blame anyone if they got whiplash trying to follow the story <laughs> amid the other fire hose of, of extreme news media that we've been uh, receiving over the last few weeks. But in that sort of um, open case shut case coverage, I've seen that it's unlikely we're going to expect to see the the Asian giant hornet here in Philadelphia. And I'm guessing that has to do with environmental conditions. So what is it about the, the Northwest region that makes it such a nice uh, environment for the, for the Asian giant hornet? And are there major differences then um, between the Northwest and, and the Mid-Atlantic region here that might um, keep the Asian giant hornet from establishing itself here? Okay, so there's a bunch there to unpack. Uh, the North, the Pacific Northwest does have a much milder climate than here. Uh, they typically don't have as harsh of winters. Um, that being said, Asian giant hornets uh, range from India all the way through uh, China and into, um, I think, parts of southern Russia and northern Japan. So there are, if you compare it, you know, climate to climate, there are Asian giant hornets that exist in areas of Asia that get similar climates to here. Um, now, we don't know where the Asian giant hornets that were in the Pacific Northwest got introduced from. If they're introduced from, say, southern Japan, where they have a milder climate, they may not be able to colonize over here. But if we had an a separate introduction of specimens from the northern part of their range, they might be able to survive here. We don't know. Um, and as far as I know, nobody's done kind of climate modeling and niche modeling um, on Asian giant horns to see where in the U.S. they could survive, where would be the best places. Uh, if you're looking to, you know, just randomly, the Pacific Northwest is a great place because it is so mild. Um, so it's lucky for the Asian giant hornets that they showed up there and not somewhere else because they may have just died. Um, but again, I'm not sure that they couldn't survive here. They might be able to survive here just fine. Uh, I'm based on just how wide their geographic range is in their native area. Um, the big reason we don't think they're gonna be here anytime soon, separate of just their own novel introduction, is uh, based on, again, the, the annual nest structure uh, that the wasps have. So the only individual that's going out and forming a new nest, so the only uh, individuals that are expanding the range are those queens in the fall. Uh, and they may fly, you know, one or two or maybe a couple kilometers from the nest on their own. So on their own, they're probably going to expand fairly slowly from that. If they become established in the Northwest, they'll expand slowly out of that. The big danger is going to be uh, transporting overwintering females in other materials. So the same way that they got here, if they get into packing material in something that gets transported across the country, if they overwinter in, I don't know, the side of a mobile home or, uh, I don't know, a vehicle or something that gets moved over the winter and then they wake up here, uh, that could certainly move them much faster than they normally would. But uh, because the workers don't fly out and form their own nests, the only reproductive uh, parts of the colony are those females in the fall. Uh, there's just the only time the they as a species can expand is when those queens move. Okay. Yeah, we can, humans, sometimes we get in our own way, I suppose. It's, it's worth noting that a lot of invasive species are, are due to human behavior and sort of the product of a globalized society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a nice transition to a question that's 
really been um, on my mind. And it has to do with our track record of eradicating some of these invasive species. I, I think about the spotted lantern fly here in the mid-Atlantic. We've talked a bit about that uh, specific species on this series. Um, and we've had some trouble certainly containing and we're nowhere near eradicating uh, the spotted lantern fly. I mean, does this poor track record portend well for us in this case? I mean, are there any major differences um, in attempts to eradicate the Asian giant hornet versus let's say the, the spotted lantern fly? Okay. Um, we as people do have a poor record of eradicating invasive species. Um, often what happens is we don't eradicate it, but we we introduce biocontrol agents or some mitigating factors. So they aren't the problem that they once were. So the problems they create are mitigated. And so they just become a part of the environment that doesn't um, cause as many problems. Uh, there's still hope to eradicate spotted lanternfly, although I think that is dwindling by the year. Uh, so at this point, I think we're just trying to keep it contained as best we can until we introduce biocontrol agents that will mitigate the the how bad they are. Uh, we the USDA does have two biocontrol agents in quarantine that they're testing. Uh, so hopefully those can get released soon for spotted lanternfly. Um, but again, because of the way the social structure of Asian giant horns, I think we have a much better chance of eradicating them than we do a lot of other pests. Um, because the only reproductive individuals are those queens in the fall, if we can find nests and kill them before they produce those reproductives, then you've eliminated that the reproductive potential of that colony. So the colony that was found in, Van, in Vancouver Island was killed before it produced any reproductives. So that nest is a reproductive unit didn't reproduce. It, it didn't send out new queens and didn't cause further establishment of that species. If that was the only nest of that species in North America, then we've killed it, it's gone. Um, now the open question is, was that the only nest? Um, it might be that they've been established here for a couple of years and there are, you know, in a reasonably small area, but there are more nests. Um, Washington State Department of Agriculture and presumably their counterparts in British Columbia are gonna do extensive surveys for them this year. Uh, but if we can find every nest before they send out reproductives, uh, even if that takes a couple of years, we find 90% of them this year, and only 10% of the nests put out reproductives and we keep going for a couple of years and killing the nests before they, they produce queens, I think we have a really good chance of eradicating it. Unlike say spotted lanternfly where um, that chance is probably come and gone. So it sounds like some of the solutions then to eradicating invasives depend ultimately on, on people power. And, and maybe that's why it's so challenging to, I suppose, drum up the resources to, to address these issues. Yeah, in, in people power in the natural history of the, the pest in question, um, I think because it's a social wasp, we, uh, I think that is in our favor. Uh, unlike say spotted lanternfly where every female has the potential, potential to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So while we were talking there, we use the term biocontrol and specifically on the topic of spotted lanternfly biocontrol. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard perhaps that the uh, praying mantis is emerging as a, as a possible biocontrol and natural solution to uh, tamping down the um, spotted lanternfly spread. And I raise that specifically because we've had a few questions uh, particularly pertaining to praying mantises. Um, and so if you'll indulge me, they're a little yes. bit off track here. Um, the first has to do with, do we know if the praying mantis eats the killer Hornets, um, and I'll add spotted lantern fly there too for my own selfish uh, interest. <laughs> and then Jess, uh, age nine, asks, "How can I get praying mantises to live in my yard?" Okay. Um, so praying mantises, uh, and what most people think of are actually Chinese mantises. Uh, it was a, it's the largest species of mantid in the world. Uh, they're native to China and Eastern Asia and have been introduced widely across North America and the US. Uh, they're the big green ones. Uh, we also have European mantises here, which were also introduced in a variety of native species, uh, such as Carolina mantises, which are about half the size of the Chinese species. Um, the big ones, the, the Chinese mantids, uh, will eat spotted lanternflies. They will eat Asian giant hornets. Uh, the problem with them is, is that they're generalist predators. 
So they eat anything that they can overpower. Uh, they're not specifically going after either one of those pests. And so while they will eat them, there's just never enough mantids around to exert any kind of meaningful control. Um, so they just, they're, they're out there doing their thing. They'll kill a few of them, but ultimately probably won't help that much. <clears throat> if you want to get mantises in your yard, uh, the best way to do that is to have tall grass. They really like getting in tall grassy areas. Um, maybe you can convince your parents if you live in a more <laughs> rural area not to cut grass in a little patch for a while and let it grow up and get wild. Uh, or barring that, uh, if you have some kind of fields that are overgrown and grassy near you, go uh, hunting out there. You can find loads of mantises in those kind of areas. Um, you can also find, uh, now would be a great time, uh, and in the fall, find mantis egg cases. They lay them on blades of grass and on other things. Uh, you can find photos of them online. And once you get that image of what it looks like, you can go out into a field and find a dozen of them with no problem. They're all over. Uh, in the right habitat. So if you want to raise your own, you could go find an egg case and let them hatch out and um, feed them fruit flies or other small flies until you get a big mantis. There we go. I love it. I love it. So I think we'll um, we'll wrap with this final question here. And it's it's always important to me then to, to give our viewers an opportunity to do the what's next. And so for this, it sounds like there's still a lot of emerging science, still a lot of unknowns, um, but where can we look to uh, for reliable information, uh, both on, on the spotted lanternfly certainly, but, but more importantly on the, on the uh, giant hornet as it pertains to our discussion today and on other emerging pests. Sure, so the best places to look for information on uh, insect pests and other pests are uh, either federal and state uh, agencies, so USDA, um, uh, State Departments of Agriculture, um, Departments of Forestry, similar kind of state agencies, uh, and also land-grant colleges. So um, things like Penn State or uh, Ohio State, if it's the name of the state and then state university or, you know, university of and then the state name, that's more than likely going to be a land-grant university. Uh, they are heavily invested in agriculture, and they are great places to look for information. Yeah, excellent recommendation. Their land grant offices um, exist in every state, um, and they are federally supported. So, uh, hopefully, those resources will continue. Ooh, and and um, related to the the land grant universities are the extension services. So, yes. um, they're kind of the extension services are an arm of that, but they're more geared at getting information to the public. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a land grant, or sorry, we have an extension office in almost every county. Uh, it's a physical office. You can go in and ask questions about agriculture or anything in your house, um, pests and, and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure if every other state out there has such an extensive extension system as Pennsylvania, but every state has some sort of extension system. So that's a great way to get information as well. Excellent point. Well, thank you, Dr. Sparla. Um, you mentioned those extension offices. The link that we provided indeed is a link to uh, information on the giant hornet, the Asian giant hornet, as we've been talking about today um, from the extension office. So once again, thank you, Dr. Michael Sparla, Professor of Arthropod Identification with the Penn State University. And I hope you've enjoyed today's Facebook Live with our Franklin Outside series. We're coming to you live again next week at 3 p.m. So don't miss us then. Thank you and take care. should be off.